A Tree in the Trail, chapters 13, 14, and 15. The Post Office Tree. The Indians rode out of sight, leaving two puzzled youths behind. Look, cried Jim, feathers and ribbons dangling up there. Swan, this old tree's waving its arm, ready to speak a piece. Buck squinted up and down and all about. A pond tube youths, a tree like an old squaw. Yep, this is her, Jed. You ever heard of a talking tree? Well, of course not. One of the Indians told Pa, a mountain man, what they wouldn't tell other whites. This here is a medicine tree, and Buck talked while the sun sank and stars shimmered like tiny candle flames among the matted twigs. Next afternoon, the wagons came rolling like white-sailed ships on a grassy sea and camped around the pond. The others were surprised to find the two young men alive. That morning, painting warriors had attacked the train at Cow Creek. But the circle of wagons with all lost livestock safe inside was too strong a stock stockade and they had ridden away. When the two told their story, the caravan captain was surprised. Never did know why Indians hung doodads on these limbs, he said, nor why they never ambushed us from these rocks. Us wagon men nowadays know your medicine tree as plain old post office. This hollow where lightning burned once is where we post letters for anybody going to the right direction to carry to civilization. That evening, Jed and Buck watched fireflies flicker up the trunk. Think of it, said Jed, softly staring upwards. We've been saved by this old cottonwood. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Well, don't feel too solemn about it yet, yawned Buck from his blankets. Plenty of men have died on trees before now and under him. It's only fair for some trees to do somebody some good for a change. Chapter 14 Cottonwoods don't live forever. In the years following, Jed Simpson became known as the best wagon master on the Santa Fe Trail. Each spring, when the prairie grass was tall enough for horses and oxen to eat, small groups of covered wagons left the towns of Independence on the Missouri. They collected about 150 miles further west in a woodland called Council Grove. Here Jed was usually chosen as captain of the combined wagon train for the trip, and Buck Smith was chief scout and head of the guards. It was always a high spot for the journey after Council Grove when the train neared the tree in the trail. Jed and Buck would ride ahead, remembering the wild ride they'd once made. Before the wagons arrived, they would examine old post off to see how it had weathered the icy gales of the winter before. When Buck wasn't looking, Jed would give the gnarled trunk a friendly pat. Thanks again, he would say, for saving us. And he always mailed a letter in the hollow for some eastbound person to carry back to Independence, telling the trader for whom he worked how the trip was going. He also included a few words from Buck, who could not write. Buck was forever finding the tree worse off than the year before. He could count the dead branches. Each season there were more. Jed kept saying the tree would, tree would just pull through many another year, but at this Buck usually exploded. After all, he said, it's only cottonwood and cottonwoods don't live forever. This ain't even got the lifespan of a basswood. This here tree is old because it's always had a water supply from the spring pond. She's already 60-some years overdue to die, and she's dying from the top down, sure shooting. Though he knew the truth, Jed would not give in. The old tree dies. June 11, 1834, notice to any wagon driver, mountain man, or other animal which can read this letter, please take it to Chris Johnson Trader at Independence, and I thank you kindly. Dear Mr. Jonathan, kept this date at Post Office Tree. After a good trip, 20 days out, this season looks good. No bad storms this year. All men and animals well, but the old tree is deader than a wheel spoke. Hoping you say, I beg you remain truly, Jed X. Simpson Buck says so too. The old tree dies. One year, spring came quickly to the white-colored plains. Snow melted from the rusty grass, rain fell, and the earth was alive with water. But though moisture soaked the old tree's work, new sap did not rise into the ancient bark, and so the tree was dead. It had been a companion to bird, beast, and men. Now it stood bare upon the windswept hills, no longer a living thing but a piece of wood. Yet to the buffalo who rubbed against the trunk, it did not seem changed. Birds still flocked among the leafless branches. Its top limbs still pointed out the trail as if to say, 
There it lies. Yonder lies the trail to golden deserts and high far hills. Seasons and centuries have passed me by while I have stood rooted to the earth. But westward lies shining mountains against a bright sky. Go that way, go that way. When the new grass was tall enough for forage, Jed's wagons came rumbling along the trail. The two friends rode towards the hill. By gum, said Buck, gazing carefully ahead. She's dead. Old Paul Stoffins has passed the happy hunting grounds. You're crazy, replied Jed Squidhard. I see leaves. Playing cards by moonlight has plum ruined your eyesight, snorted Buck. Either that or you just can't face the truth. I'll lay you ten to two. There ain't no green feathers on that timber. I'll take that back, girl old Jed. But remember, one leaf, one little green bud, even then, she's still alive. That evening by the campfire, Jed slowly painted a note. And when the next morning sun arose on the disappearing wagons, a sunbeam <coughs> crept in the whole hollow, lighting the message. A tree in the Trail, chapters 13, 14, and 15.